Thank you. That concludes general questions. We now move to First Minister's questions, and I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, <laughs> Presiding Officer. The Auditor General last week criticised the SNP for failing to record the crucial decision to go ahead with ferry contracts that have so far cost the taxpayer a quarter of a billion pounds. In response, a Scottish Government spokesperson said a thorough search has been conducted and the paperwork cannot be located. <laughs> that is laughable. A few weeks ago, the First Minister was telling us a big boy did it and ran away. Now the dog's eaten all our homework. <laughs> First Minister, these excuses would not cut it in a primary school classroom. So do you really expect anyone to believe this? And will you tell us, where has that crucial document gone? First Minister. Well, first of all, there are actually more than 200 documents uh, amounting to more than 1,500 pages relating to these decisions already in the public domain. They were published by the Scottish Government and they have been there for uh, quite some time for anyone to read and scrutinise. Uh, there, is, uh, there is one piece, one piece of documentation that is not there, which is the formal record of the decision to proceed with the final contract award. Uh, that is absolutely a key decision. Uh, but there are two further points uh, that I think it is important to make. Uh, further, uh, firstly, there is no evidence that this has been withheld. In fact, let me quote the Auditor General. Well, let me quote the Auditor General at the committee last week. Our judgment is not that evidence has been withheld from us during the course of our audit work but rather that an important piece of documentary evidence was not prepared in relation uh, to the judgment ministers arrived at. That's the first point. Secondly, what is missing is a note confirming that ministers have considered the issues and the risks and decided to proceed. However, uh, that is nevertheless clear in all of the surrounding documentation. So there was advice to uh, ministers on the 8th of October. It says, uh, and I'm summarising here, we would welcome the minister's confirmation uh, that he has considered the CMAL note, aware of the procurement and financial risks and uh, content to give approval uh, to CMAL to proceed. And then the day after that, uh, on the 9th of October, uh, Transport Scotland writes to CMAL uh, and says, and I quote, the Scottish ministers have also seen and understood uh, the CMAL risk paper and have noted and accepted the various technical and commercial risks identified and assessed by CMAL and have indicated that they are content for CMAL to proceed with the award of the contract. So ah. the Minister's decision is actually narrated yeah. in the letter that Transport yeah. Scotland not, not uh, writes. So there is, there is yeah. one link in the chain that is missing, but you can still very clearly follow the chain of events, something that Douglas Ross clearly hasn't even tried to do. Right, right. Let, let's try and get this straight. <laughs> At the time, Nicola Sturgeon said this was one of the achievements we are most proud of. Yeah. Now we are expected to believe that there is not a shred of evidence about the final crucial decision. They were, they were, so, they were so proud of it, they did not want anyone to know about it. First Minister, given your pride, that should have been hanging on your wall. And, and maybe that's it. Absolutely. Maybe that's where the document is, hanging up <laughs> in Nicola Sturgeon's wall in Butte House. Yeah. Because, of course, the excuse we've just heard from the First Minister is there are hundreds of documents available, but wow, not the one we need. Yeah. Not the one the Auditor General was looking at. The vital document, it has vanished into thin air. Yeah. So can the First Minister say, with a straight face, that this does not look like an almighty cover-up? Yeah. And I'll ask again, because she didn't answer, where has that document gone? First that Minister. document uh, would have been an email or a note that would have said uh, the Minister is content on the basis uh, of the, the reasons set out. Um, there are, D Douglas Ross says, well, firstly, can I say, uh, first of all, it was and is an achievement to have saved almost 400 jobs. 400 people, as we speak, working in Ferguson's shipyard right now, earning a wage, supporting their families. I know jobs don't matter that much to the Conservatives, but they matter to this government, and they always will. So let me, 
run through it again. On the 8th of October 2015, a submission goes to ministers asking for confirmation that ministers have considered the CMAL note, are aware of the potential procurement and financial risks. Of course, the mitigations are set out uh, in this submission and are content to proceed. The next day, Transport Scotland uh, writes to CMAL and they say Scottish ministers have seen and understood the risk paper and have noted and accepted uh, the technical and commercial risks and have decided to proceed. So the decision is recorded there. Uh, the bit that is missing uh, is that link in the chain in between these two things that simply say the minister is content. But the fact that ministers were content is narrated in the document the next day. Can I suggest to Douglas Ross it might be a good use of his time to actually go and read the 200 documents and the 1,500 pages that are published on the Scottish Government website? Douglas Ross. Well, can I say to the First Minister, it might be a good use of her time and this Parliament's time if she answers the question, because again, there is nothing. And, and this is Nicola Sturgeon, who has more ministers than ever before, more special advisers than ever before, more communication staff than ever before, and none of them can find the vital link, as she has called it, none of them can find the vital link that is missing. The First Minister claims to be a master of detail, right up until the point that the government makes a mistake. <laughs> then her memories like a sieve. Every time the going gets tough, we hear she can't recall, she doesn't know, she's not sure. We are supposed to believe a quarter of a billion pound decision was either never written down, has vanished, or has been illegally destroyed. The First Minister has botched this and covered up mistakes. Those trying to get to the bottom of this have been unable to because Ferguson Marine employees can't speak openly because of SNP gagging orders. Yeah. Now, the First Minister could change that. So will she tell us, and she's rifling through her folder, how many gagging orders were issued and will she waive them all today to end this secrecy? And I'm going to keep asking, where has the vital document gone? As the Auditor General said last week, it has not been withheld. It was, uh, in his judgment, not prepared. So I am answering uh, that question. But let me, let me say again, let me set out again. So on the 8th of October 2015, uh, there is a submission goes to ministers setting out CMAL's concerns, setting out the issues uh, with the guarantee, setting out the steps that had been taken yeah. to mitigate those risks. That was what uh, ministers considered. Then on the 9th of October, the very next day, uh, Transport Scotland narrates to CMAL, yes, it is a third time because Douglas Ross yeah, doesn't seem to want to understand it. So I'm going to read it. Perhaps First Minister, Perhaps first, first a bit minister, more slowly. First Minister, sorry, um, when people are asking questions or responding to questions, I would be grateful if everyone else could cease from contributing at that point. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, so let me just read it again a bit more slowly. The Scottish ministers have also seen and understood the CMAL risk paper and have noted and accepted the various technical and commercial risks identified and assessed by CMAL and have indicated that they are content for CMAL to proceed with the award of the contracts. So on the basis of the advice uh, on the 8th of October, that is the decision that is narrated to CMAL uh, on the 9th of yeah. October. Uh, and secondly, on the issue of non-disclosure agreements, the Scottish Government actually negotiated with the FML, uh, so the previous owners of the, the yards, administrators, to secure the release of their employers who gave evidence to the committee inquiry from their terms and conditions of employment confidentiality obligations. And the Scottish Government fully complied with Audit Scotland's inquiry uh, and will encourage everybody to do so uh, fully with any future investigations or inquiries. So, again, I'm asking questions that Nicola Sturgeon won't answer. I specifically, I specifically asked how, well, SNP members don't want to hear this, but I asked how many gagging orders are in place, yeah. so how many are there, and will the First Minister agree to waive them today? Because she has quoted the Auditor-General from last week, let's quote him from this morning. 
he told the Public Audit Committee of this Parliament that he would speak to Ferguson employees if those gagging orders were removed. So let's allow him to do his job, First Minister. And the Auditor General also said last week, and I quote, we recommend that there needs to be a fuller review. Lessons learned feels too glib to describe the circumstances before us. But all we've heard from Nicola Sturgeon is one glib statement after another. When asked to apologise to the Islanders, she dismissively said, oh, for goodness sake. That was the response from Nicola Sturgeon to Islanders who are struggling right now. Her feeble excuse for wasting a quarter of a billion pounds on these ferries is it's regrettable. First Minister, it is not regrettable. It is scandalous. It is absolutely scandalous. And we know advice was given to government ministers not to go ahead with the deal, and we know they ignored it. So can the First Minister finally come clean and tell us she mentions Scottish government ministers, but did she personally see that advice not to proceed with this deal before the decision was made? And for the fourth and final time today, Will she tell us where that vital piece of documentation is? First Minister, this, the leadership is uh, in some uh, difficulty, but this really is desperate stuff. I have uh, quoted from the advice given to ministers. I have quoted from the Transport Scotland uh, letter that went to CMAL uh, narrating the decision uh, that ministers uh, took. But let me go back to issues of non-disclosure agreements. Nobody, and let me say this very clearly, nobody in the employment of Ferguson Shipyard will be prevented in any way, shape or form from speaking to Audit Scotland and speaking in full to Audit Scotland. And uh, I can point again to the fact it was the Scottish Government that negotiated with FML's administrators to actually release employees uh, from the confidentiality, obli confidentiality obligations they had back then. So everybody will be fully free and enabled to speak uh, to Audit Scotland. Um, and secondly, in terms of uh, my uh, views on island communities, I think, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong here, I think the official report will show uh, the regret I expressed about the impact on island communities. Yeah. Uh, and uh, next, in terms of a fuller review, I think the first uh, exchange we had on this issue after the Audit Scotland report was published, I pointed uh, to the recommendation about uh, a fuller review and said that we would be considering the terms of that. Uh, but I think, and actually I, I think the Auditor General said this last week, uh, that the, the focus now, the priority must be on completing the ferries and a key milestone, of course, uh, was delivered uh, in that vein yesterday. Um, and lastly, I take full responsibility for everything this government does. Uh, I always will, and perhaps that's the difference between me and some other leaders across these yeah. islands. Yeah. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, today is Workers' Memorial Day. We pause to remember all those who have lost their lives simply doing their jobs and resolve to campaign for workplaces free from harm. Yesterday, a judge at the High Court England ruled the policy of discharging positive and untested COVID patients into care homes was unlawful, unreasonable and irrational. It was described as one of the most devastating policy failures in the modern era that cost lives. Does the First Minister accept that her decision to send untested and positive patients into care homes in Scotland was unlawful, unreasonable, irrational and cost lives? First Minister. Uh, no, no I, I don't accept uh, that, although these are matters now rightly and properly that will be scrutinised by the public inquiry uh, that uh, is underway in Scotland uh, and of course the uh, parallel public inquiry uh, that will take place into these matters UK wide and of course these are matters that will be rightly and properly scrutinised should any legal cases uh, be brought in Scotland. Um, I think the most important thing I want to say today is that my thoughts uh, are with every single family who has lost a loved one during the course of the pandemic uh, in care homes and indeed across wider society. Uh, we're obviously aware of the ruling at the High Court yesterday regarding uh, decisions made uh, by the UK Secretary of State for England. Uh, the priority of all of us um, during this pandemic has been to save lives uh, at all points uh, and we have sought to take the best decisions based on the best scientific and clinical evidence that we had at any given time. All nations developed guidance uh, based on what we understood at the time. 
Uh, the guidance in Scotland uh, is broadly similar to the guidance that was in place in England, but not identical. Uh, there were some differences uh, in the versions of the guidance. Uh, one of the things that our guidance emphasised from the 13th of March and the 26th of March 2020 was that residents should remain in their rooms so far as possible uh, and routine visiting should be suspended. We also required isolation from the 26th of March of anyone discharged to a care home who had been in contact with COVID cases, even if they were not displaying symptoms. Uh, it is right and proper that these matters uh, are fully scrutinised by the public inquiry. The last thing I would say, presiding officer, is that, and I've said it before, um, there is nothing anybody in this chamber uh, will say to me that makes me feel the weight of these decisions any heavier than I already do um, and will do uh, for every day of the rest of my life. I took all of these decisions, uh, as did my ministers, as did the government, in good faith, best, based on the best information we had at the time. Anna Sarwar. I'm sorry, but th that last part is fine in words, but actually the extraordinary and unthinkable answer that we don't accept the judgment, particularly when the almost identical thing happened in Scotland. And let's look at what the judgment makes clear. Irrational, unreasonable and lawful, given what governments knew. So let's look at what happened in Scotland. As early as the 4th of February, this government's advisers were suggesting that asymptomatic transmission was a possibility. On the 13th of February, this government's advisers were saying that asymptomatic transmission was likely. On the 13th of March, despite warnings from care home staff, this government's guidance said do not hinder discharge from hospitals. On the 26th of March, this government's guidance said individuals being discharged from hospital do not routinely need confirmation of a negative COVID test. As late as the 17th of April, this government's health secretary was saying there was still not a strong case to test patients before discharge even though testing guidelines had changed in England on the 15th of April. And by the time the government changed their guidance and guidelines on the 21st of April, nearly 3,000 untested people and 75 known positive cases had already been transferred into Scotland's care homes. Does the First Minister accept, in the words of the families affected and impacted, that this was a shameful, unforgivable criminal act that costs lives in Scotland. My, my, my thoughts will be uh, with bereaved families uh, every single day of the rest of uh, my life. Uh, this is not about not accepting a judgment. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, will look very carefully at the terms of the judgment. Yesterday we have already started that process, but this was not a, a case about the situation yeah. in Scotland, and therefore yeah. this is just a statement of fact. It is not a judgment about the situation in Scotland. So it's not about not accepting that judgment, it's about recognising that very important fact. Uh, the guidance, as I have said, uh, and as anybody can look and see, was broadly similar in Scotland uh, to England and indeed in, in Wales with uh, a, a Labour government. So this has nothing to do uh, with politics. But there were, there were some uh, differences. So, for example, uh, at, at a time when there were mixed views, uh, if I can put it mildly, about the risks of asymptomatic uh, transmission, uh, our guidance from as early as 13th of March was uh, recommending that residents remain in their rooms. Uh, and from the 26th of March, uh, recommending isolation, 14-day isolation of anyone discharged to a care home, uh, even if they didn't have symptoms. Uh, so clearly uh, the risk of symptomatic, uh, asymptomatic transmission uh, was in mind uh, to some extent uh, at that point. Uh, these are matters that will be fully scrutinised by the public inquiry uh, under uh, the convenership of Lady Poole, a High Court judge in Scotland. And uh, if there are uh, other processes uh, brought in Scotland, uh, then that scrutiny will be brought to bear there too. Of course, there has been analysis undertaken by Public Health Scotland of discharges to care homes. Uh, and the finding of uh, that analysis was that there was no clear statistical evidence that hospital discharges were associated with care home outbreaks. Instead, it was care home size uh, that was more strongly related to outbreaks. So that's the analysis that's been done so far. But it is right that there is full analysis and full scrutiny by the independent public inquiry uh, whose work is now getting underway. Anna Sarwar. I'll just remind the First Minister, yes, families will be hearing the sympathies the First Minister has expressed but they'll also hear the ducking and diving 
that has been expressed by the First Minister as well. So let's look. I am sorry, Mr Swinney, you are right, it is a disgrace. Disgrace to those that lost a loved one in a care home. So let's look. I have already narrated the timeline that happened in Scotland, but let's look at the consequences of the shameful decision. In the first wave of the pandemic, 4,073 people died with COVID in Scotland. 1,900 of them were in care homes. That is almost 50 per cent. And by the time the government acted, half of all care homes in Scotland had a COVID outbreak. First Minister, families have been through the heartbreak of losing a loved one. Many of them could not be there at the final moments. And it seems that the First Minister is suggesting that those families should perhaps go through the court system here in Scotland to get to the truth. So do not force those families to relive that heartache all over again, being dragged through the courts with the emotional toll that comes with it, having to spend thousands of pounds in order to get you to admit the truth. Do you finally accept your government's decisions and actions were unlawful, unreasonable, irrational and cost lives? On an issue as serious as this, Anna Sarwar is shamefully, uh, I, I think, misrepresenting my words. I did not suggest uh, that people should have to go to court. What I, what I recognised was that people have a right, if they so choose, to go to court, and they may choose to do that. That was not a suggestion that they should. I believe people should get the answers to the questions that they have around all aspects of the handling of this pandemic without having to do that, which is why this government has set up an independent public inquiry chaired by a High Court judge. And Jackie Bailey, from a sedentary position, is asking me how long. Can I refer her to the Inquiries Act 2005? Uh, the conduct of the public inquiry uh, and uh, the rhythm of reporting and the time it takes for it to report is entirely a matter for the independence of that inquiry and not for ministers. And Jackie Bailey, from a sedentary position, I think should sh stop indulging in political commentary and actually engage in the importance of these issues. I I do not have to be uh, reminded of the numbers and the consequences of this pandemic. These uh, facts and figures and, and the human consequences are embedded in my soul and will always be. That does not mean my decisions and my actions and those of my government should in any way not be subject to scrutiny. They should be subject to full independent scrutiny and that is exactly what the independent public inquiry is going to do. That is what families deserve and they deserve that that process takes place in a proper way and I am determined that they get that. We now move to supplementary questions and I call Alistair Allen. It was uh, reported this week that despite soaring energy prices, the UK government's working group to address the cost of living has not met since the start of the Partygate scandal, and also that the Chancellor had said that it was, quote, silly to boost uh, support for energy bills. Does the First Minister share the view of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation this week that the UK Government's response to the crisis has been woefully inadequate? First Minister? Uh, yes, I do share that view. Uh, I think the response of the UK Government has been woefully inadequate. Uh, most of the resources, most of the levers uh, to tackle this crisis lie uh, with the UK Government. Some, not all I accept, but some of the factors driving this crisis uh, have happened at the hand uh, of the UK Government, uh, not least the impact and implications of Brexit, the removal of uh, universal credit from the most vulnerable families. Uh, so it's time that the UK Government stepped up uh, and responded properly. And the comment of the Chancellor that it would be silly to provide help for people now is deeply offensive to those right now across Scotland, across all parts of the UK, who are struggling to heat their homes and struggling to feed their children. It's time for Rishi Sunak, Boris Johnson and the UK Government to step up and to act. Russell Finley. A young woman called Jess Insall believes she was spiked during a night out in Glasgow and she's bravely spoken publicly about her distressing ordeal as a warning to others. But due to a 34-hour delay in police taking a sample, she will most likely never know what happened to her, let alone get justice. Instead of yet more SNP talking shops, can the First Minister tell us when her government will start taking this dangerous and predatory crime seriously? Yeah. First 
We, we do take it seriously and uh, let me put on record uh, my sympathies uh, to the young woman for her experience. Um, I think every woman in the country understands how serious offences like this are and uh, the impact and the consequences they have on lives. Clearly how the police uh, conduct criminal investigations is a matter for the police. It is not rightly a matter for ministers. Uh, I am uh, certainly uh, very willing uh, to correspond with the Chief Constable on this particular case to seek um, an, an explanation such as he is able to give uh, for the situation that has been narrated in the Chamber and to ask the Justice Secretary uh, to write to the member in due course. But these are serious crimes uh, and I know the police take them very seriously and the government does too. Jackie Bailey. Delayed discharge is increasing. The number of people dying whilst waiting to be discharged is also increasing. Almost 400 people in the last year alone. Each of these statistics is a loved one who died unable to get the care package they needed. The SNP promised to end delayed discharge over seven years ago, but three health ministers later, they have simply failed to do so. Despite initiatives, which I'm sure we'll hear a list of from the First Minister, delayed discharge has gone up by 57%, so it's clearly not working. So does the First Minister agree that this is a scandal and the human cost of the SNP's failure to take effective action? First Minister. Well, Jackie Bailey says three health ministers uh, later. What she omits to say, of course, is a global pandemic uh, later, uh, which has impacted on these things in Scotland, in England, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, and probably in literally every country in the world. Uh, delayed discharge is unacceptable, um, and that is why uh, she is right to say that I will talk about uh, the actions we are taking, because the actions are important. So £62 million to enhance care at home, £48 million to increase the pay of those working in the social care sector, uh, £40 million to support interim care arrangements, £20 million to enhance uh, multidisciplinary uh, teams, two new programmes that have been launched, uh, the Interface Care and Discharge Without Delay uh, programmes uh, supported by a further £10 million. Uh, so we will continue to take the action and make the investments to get delayed discharge down as we recover uh, in our NHS, as we recover across society from the impact of the global pandemic. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Borders Buses has had to restrict its timetables and essential service in my rural constituency due to a shortage of bus drivers following Brexit. The UK Government refuses to place bus drivers on its shortage occupation list as the UK Migration Advisory Council does not consider this occupation meets the threshold. I think that is completely wrong. Does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Christine Graham is highlighting an issue uh, that is relevant in her local authority area, but it is sadly all too evident in other areas and actually in other industries as well. Uh, we are experiencing a shortage of bus drivers and also haulage drivers and workers from many parts of the food and drink industry and also, of course, in the health service and in social care. Uh, Scotland is, as we warned, uh, paying the price for a Brexit we didn't vote for. And despite repeatedly asking for a formal role in determining what occupations are in shortage in the devolved nations, we've been denied this. And so we've been unable to ensure that bus drivers are included in the shortage occupation list. Uh, I understand that the UK Government will be reviewing this list later uh, this year and we've asked for full involvement in that process. Uh, but we've also set up our own group involving operators, COSLA and other public agencies to find ways to resolve such workforce issues. Uh, but these are issues caused by Brexit. Uh, they are the fault of the Conservative Government and it's high time uh, they took action to address these issues. Stephen Kerr. Officer, I've been contacted by many students who feel sick with worry because of the decision of their college lecturers to go on strike during the most critical phase of their studies just before their final assessments and exams. With classes being suspended, students face getting no feedback on assessments. They are unsure if exams are going to go ahead as planned, and they even face taking exams without having completed their courses. It's clear to see, presiding officer, that students are the real victims in this dispute. What support is the Scottish Government prepared to offer students who have been left hanging for the second year in a row due to the failure of management and unions to settle their dispute? First Minister. Colleges, uh, as I know the member is aware, are independent institutions. Um, it is for employers uh, to negotiate uh, with unions uh, pay 
and conditions. And I would expect to see employers uh, get round the table uh, with the college unions uh, and come to an agreement uh, that takes away the risk and the reality of strike action. Uh, the Scottish Government will continue to work closely with all parties to ensure that there is a process with constructive conversations on both sides. But I would uh, say to colleges, uh, the employers in this matter, uh, to ensure that they are engaging uh, to resolve this issue as quickly as possible. And we will continue to support students uh, in every way we possibly can. But the way we will support students best is to ensure that employers uh, get round the table with the unions and resolve this dispute. Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In making a successful bid to host the Goal Global Seafood Alliance Conference in autumn of 2024, Scotland has been selected to host a major international event. This will put the spotlight on the world-class and highly sought-after produce that comes from Scotland's seas and oceans. Last night, I had the pleasure of sponsoring an event in Parliament, celebrating the tastes, sounds and culture of the island of Butte, including smoked trout and salmon. Will the First Minister join with me in congratulating Seafood Scotland for putting this bid together and wishing them well in showcasing some of the very best sea seafood available anywhere on the planet? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Jenny Minto for, for that question. And I would take the opportunity to congratulate Seafood Scotland. Uh, due to uh, their work, this prestigious event will be held in Scotland in 2024, the first time it has been held anywhere in the UK, and it will be a global showcase for Scotland at its best. The seafood sector has faced enormous challenges as a result of Brexit, and it's really heartening to see our investment deliver innovation, sustainability uh, and quality be recognised internationally. Our recent launch of the Blue Economy Vision underpins our commitment to help producers continue to deliver high quality produce from clean, well-managed Scottish waters. It's a great recognition of the dedication that our seafood producers have demonstrated and a platform for Scotland to continue to shine globally. And I hope everybody in the Chamber uh, will join me in congratulating Seafood Scotland on such a success. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on whether Police Scotland's procedures and training for responding to cases of domestic abuse are sufficient. First Minister. The training and development of officers and the operational delivery of policing is, of course, a matter for the Chief Constable. Uh, that said, I am assured that Police Scotland are committed to proactively targeting perpetrators and protecting victims and their families from the horrors of domestic abuse, abuse and the significant harm that it does. To support implementation of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018, the Scottish Government uh, provided funding for the training of 14,000 police officers and staff and the appointment of 700 domestic abuse champions to embed training and sustain organisational change. Officers in Scotland are therefore uh, more aware and informed now around the dynamics of domestic abuse. Police Scotland are also undertaking divisional reviews on their policing response to domestic abuse across the country, which includes partnership and multi-agency engagement and working. Pam Gossel. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Today, Caroline Lyons, mother to Louise Atchison, who was murdered in 2020 by her boyfriend, who had convictions for abusing women, is here in Parliament, calling for a swift fatal accident inquiry after Police Scotland admitted to 18 separate errors, meaning her daughter was never notified of her partner's violent history. Does the First Minister therefore agree that the current system is simply not doing enough to keep victims safe and that a measure such as domestic abuse register is needed to ensure any potential victim knows where, sorry, when they are at risk? First Minister. Firstly, Presiding Officer, can I uh, take the opportunity to welcome Louise's mum uh, to the chamber, although I am sure uh, she does not want to be here in the circumstances in which uh, she is. I absolutely understand her desire uh, for a fatal accident inquiry and for that fatal accident inquiry to be taken forward as quickly as possible. Um, it is the case, of course, and I know members across the chamber understand this, that the Lord Advocate is constitutionally responsible for the investigation uh, of deaths in Scotland and uh, conducts that responsibility independently uh, of government. So decisions on whether or not a fatal accident inquiry is held uh, and the timing of the initiation of such an inquiry is also a matter for the Lord Advocate. But I will make sure that uh, the, the detail of this exchange is brought to the attention of the Lord Advocate uh, later 
today. In terms of uh, the other uh, parts of the question, which I think are uh, entirely reasonable, um, the proposal for uh, a domestic abuse uh, offender uh, register. Uh, we keep the law under uh, continual review and we are always open to exploring options uh, to reduce crime, particularly uh, crime of this nature. Uh, so we will look uh, carefully at the detail of any uh, measure put forward um, and the Justice Secretary I know, would be happy to engage on that. Uh, of course, uh, there already is uh, a domestic abuse disclosure uh, scheme in place uh, in Scotland. Uh, the purpose of that scheme is to allow people to make informed decisions about their situation uh, when they may be at risk in a relationship. And that scheme also allows Police Scotland to tell people uh, that they may be at risk and this information can be given even if it has not been asked for. Uh, finally, Presiding Officer, I, I do think we always have to be open to improvements uh, here. Uh, there is a real need for us to do everything possible to protect uh, women and children in particular because they are uh, most often the victims of domestic abuse to protect women and children as much as possible. So the government will remain open uh, to any suggestions and proposals that are brought forward. In terms of this uh, particular uh, case, it is of course right uh, that any uh, issues there are properly scrutinised in the course of uh, the fatal accident inquiry process, which as I said is a matter for the Lord Advocate. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As their regional MSP, it is a privilege to host Louise Aitchison's family in Parliament today on what is the second anniversary of Louise's death. I want to thank them for giving all of us the opportunity to remember Louise because she is a person that matters today. In life, Louise gave so much love, care and service to others. This is Louise. We should remember her and saving other women's lives will be her legacy. As the family are in the gallery today and um, look forward to meeting other MSPs after questions today, will the First Minister join me in paying tribute to Louise's mother, Caroline Lyon, and also to Marion Scott and the Sunday Post for their work in securing this important fatal accident inquiry. The First Minister has recognised the importance of that work continuing or, or starting at urgent pace so that lessons can be learned. Um, will she also confirm when domestic homicide reviews will be introduced? First Minister. Well, on that latter point, I will return to the member uh, with uh, a specific answer to that uh, so that um, I'm giving uh, the right information. Um, can I thank Monica Lennon for uh, remembering uh, Louise in the way she has in the Chamber. Um, I do want to pay tribute to Louise's family, not just for being here today, but for uh, raising these issues because, uh, well, I can only imagine how incredibly difficult it must be for any bereaved family, uh, bereaved in these circumstances, to do this. Uh, but doing it does uh, make sure uh, that we can act uh, to reduce the risk uh, that other uh, women uh, are subjected uh, to domestic abuse uh, and suffer. Uh, as Louise uh, did. So I want to not just pay tribute to them, but to thank them uh, for the courage and the bravery uh, that they are, are, are showing. Uh, there are clearly questions um, around uh, Louise's uh, situation, um, and we've heard uh, them already in this exchange. Uh, that is why it is right uh, that a fatal accident inquiry takes place, uh, but also right for me to uh, say that the conduct of that must be allowed to be independent. Um, and uh, I hope it does give the family answers uh, and comfort. Uh, for my part, uh, I will continue to ensure that the government acts in all possible ways uh, to do everything we can to protect women from uh, domestic abuse. And I do believe uh, that Louise's family's uh, bravery uh, and courage uh, at such a sad time and on such a sad day for them uh, will help with that. Uh, I didn't know uh, Louise, uh, but I'm sure uh, not just that she uh, was a wonderful young woman, but I'm sure she would be very proud of her family today. Question number four, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Climate Change Makers Impact Report from the Scottish Children's Parliament. First Minister. Um, I welcome the impact report. A fundamental part of Scotland's climate assembly process uh, was the involvement of children. Uh, I'm pleased that the impact report recognises the government's work to ensure children's voices are heard. We're committed to upholding children's rights, demonstrated, of course, through uh, our, our approach uh, to incorporating 
uh, the UN Convention. Uh, this inclusion of children reflects our commitment to empower children and to respect, protect and fulfil their rights. In the impact report, uh, children ask us to do more, and that is what we intend to do. At COP26, I committed to ongoing meaningful engagement between the Scottish Government and children and young people, and I remain committed to that. I'm very grateful for the children's hard work uh, and for their creativity and commitment. Stephanie Callahan. I thank the First Minister for her answer, and also a warm welcome to all the young people in our public gallery today. Can I ask more broadly what role does she see organisations such as the Children's Parliament and the Scottish Youth Parliament playing in shaping future policy, particularly, particularly in areas such as addressing the climate emergency, where we see time and time again the value of bringing younger generations into the conversation? First Minister. I think both uh, the Youth Parliament and the Children's Parliament uh, do a fantastic job and have a key role to play. Uh, our annual Cabinet meeting with children and young people uh, demonstrates, I hope, the ongoing commitment of the Government at the highest level to meaningfully engage with children and young people on the issues that matter most to them. Uh, Scottish Government core funding uh, over £580,000 this financial year of the Children's Parliament and the Scottish Youth Parliament will continue to support children and young people to participate in climate decision making. Uh, the Scottish Youth Parliament's work at COP26 was very successful and that includes partnership working with the Scottish Parliament and uh, the Children's Parliament on the moment. Uh, their work as Scottish delegates for the Conference of Youth led uh, to the public commitment I gave to work with children and young people to tackle climate change going forward. Uh, and I want to reiterate that strong commitment today. Question number five, Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will investigate the reported increasing number of children being referred to the Gender Specialist Clinic in Glasgow in light of reports of a similar inquiry planned by the UK Government. First Minister. But we are aware that referrals for young people's uh, gender identity services have increased in Scotland, as they have throughout the UK. Uh, the recent interim report from the CAS review into these services in NHS England highlighted the importance of robust data collection and the impact of long waiting times. Uh, we have already in Scotland recognised the need to improve services, including for young people. Uh, that is why uh, we plan to provide £9 million over three years to support improvement in service delivery, data collection, research and support. Uh, we do not look to replicate the work of the cash review, but as we have previously said, we will carefully consider its findings in the context of NHS Scotland services. Megan Gallagher. I thank the First Minister for her answer. According to recent reports, 263 patients under the age of 18 are being treated at the Sandyford Clinic in Glasgow. Almost 1,000 are on the waiting list for their first appointment, including 86 prepubescent children. At least 98 per cent of children who consent to take puberty blockers go on to have sex hormone treatment that can cause irreversible changes to their body. These figures are alarming. We need to balance up the need to help those who are definitely suffering from gender dysphoria with the need to protect vulnerable young people who are unsure of their identity and risk embarking on gender hormone treatment prematurely. So will the First Minister commit to a similar inquiry announced by the UK Government to ensure our young people are safeguarded? First Minister. Um, I think safeguarding is important, but I think it's also important that we properly um, understand and apply uh, principles of, of safeguarding. Um, the Scottish Government, uh, and I hope everybody would recognise that it is really important and, and right that trans people uh, or anyone questioning their gender identity should have access to the right support at the right time for them. Uh, and actually, one of the biggest issues here uh, are the waiting times uh, for access to NHS gender identity services uh, for both adults and young people, uh, which is why we're making the investments that I referenced in my original answer. It is also important uh, to recognise that in Scotland, and this is a matter of law under the Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act 1991, so uh, an act that predates the life of this Parliament, uh, any person under 16 can consent to a medical procedure or treatment where the qualified medical practitioner uh, attending them considers they are capable of understanding the nature and the possible consequences of that procedure or treatment. And decisions on the type of treatment uh, to prescribe are rightly for clinicians to make in consultation uh, with any patient following an individual assessment. Uh, on the issue of puberty uh, blockers, I think it is also important uh, to narrate uh, this. The Sandyford Young People Services reported that in the period from 2011 to uh, 2021, so a period of 11 years, 
In total, less than 193 young people were referred for an appointment with a hormone specialist. That's an average of eight uh, per year. And uh, the numbers actually being prescribed hormones uh, was, was even less than that. Uh, so let's take these issues uh, seriously, but I think we owe it uh, to everybody uh, also to treat these issues incredibly sensitively and to have at the heart uh, the rights of all young people to get the advice uh, that they need at the time that is right for them. Yeah. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government can take to encourage more women to stand for elected office. First Minister. Well, firstly, I think it's important uh, to record uh, the good news that this Parliament now has a record number of women MSPs, although it's not yet 50 per cent. And I think we should aspire uh, that all our parliaments uh, should have uh, representation at uh, national and local level to properly represent the society we live in. Uh, but there is no doubt at all that women in society, including women in public life, continue to face unacceptable levels of sexist and misogynistic behaviour. And that can, and I believe that does and is, putting many women off standing for elected office. It harms democracy, it harms all of us, and it is completely unacceptable. Uh, these things need to change. Um, and to change that, we need to see uh, men ending their sexist and misogynistic behaviour and to be much more aware of their actions and words and the impact of them. In terms of the Scottish Government's role, we fund projects to support and equip women to stand for elected office. This includes in Gender's Equal Representation Project to help political parties increase their diversity and the Young Women Lead Programme and Elect Her, which empower women to stand for elected office. Mark Stevenson. I thank the First Minister for her answer. The comments directed at Angela Rayner reported at the weekend were deeply sexist and misogynistic. Indeed, misogyny is something that women face, not just in elected office, but daily. So can the First Minister outline what work is underway to eliminate, eliminate prejudice and misogyny in Scotland? And will she join me in condemning the, comment, the comments made towards Angela Rayner? First Minister. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad to hear the support uh, across the chamber for Angela Rayner. I certainly stand in solidarity with her um, and condemn unreservedly uh, the comments that were reported on Sunday. Uh, I, like everybody else, I think, uh, or most other people, were absolutely appalled, uh, both by the male Conservative MP who thought it was OK to make these pathetic and derogatory comments, but also by the fact that we still live in a society uh, where it is deemed acceptable for a story like that to be published in a major uh, newspaper. And I think there's a lot of reflection uh, needed on both of these points. Uh, unfortunately, I am all too familiar uh, with, in my case, the Daily Mail's uh, tactics of attempting to reduce women uh, politicians to their legs, um, a tactic which, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is never used to dismiss and degrade male politicians in the way that happens to female politicians. Uh, this story, uh, sadly and depressingly, just highlighted what women already know and many women already experience on uh, a daily basis. There is deep-seated sexism and misogyny in society, and it needs to be addressed. Uh, we will continue to take the actions I set out in my earlier answer, but I am also pleased that in a response to the work of Baroness Kennedy's misogyny working group, we also committed to consult on draft legislation in advance of introducing a bill to specifically tackle misogyny. But this is something uh, for all of us, but men in particular, to reflect on. Uh, we will rue the day we make it more difficult uh, and less attractive uh, for women to come forward for election to public office. It is time to draw a line in the sand, and it's time uh, for men. Not all men are misogynists, but misogyny comes from men, and it's time for them to change. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief pause before the next item of business. Thank you.